Thank you, Kirby, and uh, so nice to see you all here, including Representative Rankin. Uh, it was a, kind of a special treat I wasn't expecting, but thanks, Bobby, for bringing her over. Does she reside at the governor's mansion? Or? In spirit. In spirit, okay. <laughs> well, it's 100 years, and this weekend uh, around Montana, fortunately, is, uh, is being commemorated with uh, significant vigor. Um, Missoula's got a, lot, got a lot going on Sunday. You all, of course, Friday and, and uh, Saturday, and Great Falls has a good bit on Sunday. I'm not sure about Helena, but the, uh, one of the fine things on Sunday is most of the cities and I think quite a few of the towns, I know Fort Benton for one, um, are going to ring bells at 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month, and that's really the uh, end of the centennial of the Great War. And it was an amazing war, and it had a profound effect on, on Montana, both at home and the Montanans that went overseas. It was a war of opportunity for, for some actually opportunity for many. It was a lot of trouble for some in a variety of ways and it was change for all. And on that significant day when April 6, 1917, when we entered our first European war against the longstanding advice of President Washington and subsequent statement, a lot of things changed um, and some of those uh, I think uh, relate directly and indirectly to Jeanette Rankin and, and Charlie Russell. And since I've given several talks both at the History Conference and here, uh, Kirby and I kind of worked out my focus today would be on those two individuals. And that's good because they did a lot uh, and, and they were active players in totally different ways. And it's pretty interesting to um, as I did my research to track down the details, I, I knew, for instance, that Jeanette Rankin had voted against the war, but I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, it's like she sort of vanished. Now, she was in Congress for the two years, but, but you don't hear much about what else she was doing during that uh, session of Congress. And it's uh, <coughs> pretty amazing to me and I think to probably all of us at how vitally important Montana was in the war effort. It, it was just a for, sort of a rare combination of the forestry, mining, smelting, refining, agriculture, and a bunch of rugged outdoor individualists, a lot of them cowboys, but a lot of them not. Uh, most of them immigrants to Montana, and two thirds of Montana at that time were either immigrants directly or sons and daughters of immigrants. So it isn't like we had a frontier descendant contingent go to war. It was a real mix, but they took a pride in a, uh, and I'll uh, uh, mention that uh, shortly, uh, in, in their Montana cowboy past. My book is, is really the first uh, full book on Montanans in World War I, and to me that tells me what I thought when I went into it, and that is it's really been a neglected war. Um, there are reasons for that, maybe we'll talk about a few of those afterwards, but uh, in, in focusing on Charlie and Nancy, Montana's first congresswoman, well, Montana fortunately had passed uh, suffrage for for women in time for the 1916 election and uh, I wanted to uh, read what I think is one of the most profound endorsements of of uh, Jeanette Rankin during the campaign and it was written by a really quiet and little known but pretty amazing country editor. I mean, the Weekly River Press with W.K. Harbor as editor spoke with a voice that a lot of the state listened to. He was never controlled by the Anaconda Company, and he also had 
a uh, sort of a line that, that paralleled Teddy Roosevelt and the progressive movement. So things like uh, suffrage for women's suffrage, he'd been for for a long time and had been campaigning for it. So what, during the campaign in the fall of 1916, Harbor wrote in his River Press, the attention of every state in the union is already centered upon the political situation in Montana because of this state's recent action in nominating a woman for a seat in the United States Congress, that this attention will become more centered after election when Miss Jeanette Rankin, Republican candidate for Congress, takes her seat in the National Legislative Assembly and demonstrates her ability to discharge the trust placed in her by the men and women of Montana is not to be doubted. It's been said that when the congressmen of various states come together in Washington, their individuality is largely swallowed up in the identity of the whole of the group, and that their individual activity, unless it's startling and significant, in significance, is taken largely as a matter of course. It's hard to imagine, however, that the action of one woman in a group of a hundred men will escape attention. Every time Miss Rankin rises to speak, the very novelty of her presence in the House of Representatives will command attention. She'll be the first woman to sit in the National Assembly, and as such, her conduct will be of interest to the entire nation. Her work has not been for suffrage alone. Miss Rankin took up suffrage work only after she'd spent several years in settlement and welfare work and was made to realize the comparative futility of her work until the women of the country should be enfranchised in order that they might effectively help to better their own conditions. It was with this broader view of what could be ultimately accomplished through the right of the franchise that Miss Rankin went into the battle for votes for women. And her leadership in the campaign that won suffrage for Montana women two years ago easily gives her the right to support of all the women uh, the support of all the women of Montana whom she helped to enfranchise regardless of their party f affiliations. Miss Rankin is a free thinker, a keen thinker, a forceful speaker, a tremendous worker. She's an intelligent student of public affairs and she has definite ideas about the needs of the state and their remedies. She spent last winter in New Zealand reputed to be the best governed country in the world studying social and industrial conditions and she's made a personal and intensive study of conditions in almost every state in the union and in every county in Montana. It would be difficult for Montana to choose a better representative. And they did choose Jeanette Rankin and sent her off to Congress and the 2nd of April when she uh, went down the aisle with uh, on the on the arm of uh, the Montana's other representative, uh, John Morgan Evans, of uh, uh, she was uh, uh, cheered and and actually cheered a series of times, and uh, what uh, Harbor had predicted was certainly the case. And oh, by the way, she became a rock star around the country too much more so, I think, maybe than in Montana. So she, uh, she arrived and uh, went to work uh, four days after she went to work, of course, on uh, the night of uh, April 6th, uh, President Wilson had asked for a declaration of war and she joined others uh, in voting against, against the war. Um, and, and that, as I mentioned, was about my knowledge of Jeanette Rankin's term in Congress. Well, it turned into a much more productive uh, uh, two years than, than that. And of course, the, the next big act for Congress, uh, we went into this war um, amazingly unprepared and uh, President Wilson, of course, had campaigned on the on the theme of uh, he kept us out of war, and uh, and and not only did he keep us keep us out of war, but he kept us from being anywhere near uh, prepared, even to the point of in 1916 uh, turning down uh, various attempts to uh, begin to uh, build the arms and and the numbers of men that. 
that we would need to uh, be a credible participant in a European war. Uh, many of you know, but I'll just remind those and tell others that our total standing army and state guard numbers in 1917 totaled 300,000 men. It was split almost evenly between the two. Um, 300,000 men is, is the number that were lost in a number of the major battles in Europe before we entered the war. Uh, we were in no way prepared to enter the war, but we plunged in, and uh, of course it was a, uh, an important event for the British and French and Belgians and the other allies. Uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, a concern to Germany, but Germany uh, in the spring of 1917 found the Russian revolution that put a social democrat government in in power and uh, weakened their war effort and of course as 1917 progressed their war effort, the Ru Russian war effort pretty well ground to a halt leading into the fall when of course the uh, Bolshevik revolution succeeded in taking power primarily on the theme of, of stop the war at any cost, and, and it was a horrendous cost for the, for the Russians in terms of territory yielded and, and so on. But, but the point is, all through 1917, things in Russia were evolving, and the Germans were increasingly uh, believing that they would be able to withdraw several million of their troops from the Eastern Front, from the Russian Front, and reinforce as they did. Um, of course, uh, after the draft legislation, which took six weeks to pass Congress, and frankly, uh, Representative Rankin was against the draft uh, initially, along with uh, many others in Congress, until they were voted down. And of course, it was totally impractical to, to build quickly into a million-man army, and that was the initial goal. And by uh, later it became two million and, and eventually four million men. Well, you're not gonna approach those numbers based totally on volunteer army in a few months period. So the draft legislation was passed about six weeks after um, Congress had convened. Now, drafting and registering the draftees went forward in the 5th of June, but they didn't start calling up draftees because where on earth would they send them? They didn't have the training camps. And so the feverish effort during the summer of 1917 was to build these massive training camps, 16 of them each equipped to handle at least 50,000 men spread around the country. The one that most Montana draftees went to was of course uh, Camp Lewis near today's Tacoma. So the Montana cowboys and miners, foresters, farmers, and, and a good many women, as a matter of fact, uh, and we'll get into that, uh, went to war over a period of time. And their battle cry was Powder River, Letter Buck. And it, it was a little bit ironic that that was already the battle cry for the second Montana infantry right here at Fort uh, William Henry Harrison. But uh, it also, uh, because it resonated so well uh, and the Montanans were such a, a powerful, enthusiastic bunch at Camp Lewis, it resonated and, and it was picked up by the draft division at Camp Lewis that was being formed. The 91st Wild West Division adopted that Powder River letter buck uh, battle cry as well. Now, Camp Lewis was a sprawling city and yet there were a few parts of it that were uh, of, of greatest interest to Montanans, and, and uh, one of those, uh, probably the most popular, was the remount station. Now, the remount station, uh, you don't hear a whole lot about, but it was extremely important. That's where the tens of thousands of horses were received, and they had to go through their medical checks, and they had to go through training, and they had to go through basically the same procedures as the men were doing to get those horses ready to go overseas. And even though this was a mechanized war and the beginning of things like a tank corps and 
uh, different types of uh, arms based on, on uh, uh, power uh, and trucks and automobiles and so on. It was still a horse-drawn war in so many ways. So Camp Lewis had this remount station and the head of it, uh, appointed head, was uh, Captain uh, Joseph W. Jackson, who was one of these great cowboys. Uh, he'd known Teddy Roosevelt, he knew Charlie Russell, he was from the Dakota-Montana border area, and he was, Captain Jackson was put in charge of the uh, remount station. And <clears throat> very early on, uh, Charlie Russell, who was, uh, um, anxious to do something symbolic to support the war, Charlie took one of his paintings and um, sent it off to Captain Jackson at the uh, remount station to bolster the morale of the Montanans and the other Northwestern troops that were there. And of course, uh, Nancy was also active. Nancy was working in support of the Liberty Loans. She, she was either the co-head or the head of the women's division of each of the four Liberty Loan divisions during the war. Um, Smoking Them Out was Charlie's painting. It was one that he already had done. I've seen a photo from 1914 of his studio. No, it was 1916 of his studio. And uh, there it is uh, hanging on the walls. But uh, he sent it off to, um, to Captain Jackson along with the, and asked him to uh, share that with the troops. And, and in fact, Jackson did. He, as you can barely see there, over the fireplace at the assembly hall in the remount station, that painting hung for the duration of the war. Charlie sent it off and, and he had uh, one of the usual Charlie great letters uh, in essence saying, I don't know a whole lot about modern war because they were in the blue and they were fighting Indians and so on in the, in the wars I know about, but, but here's what I can do for you. And oh, by the way, at the end of the war, if you get rid of this painting, make sure you get at least $1,000 for it. <laughs> so Charlie's, uh, Charlie's uh, letter is, is in my book along with the story of, uh, of how he got it there and what Captain Jackson did with it. Uh, and of course, much of Montana's anti-war sentiment bubbled on the surface through labor strikes and stoppages in Butte and, and it, was, it was so serious because uh, Butte copper uh, was extremely important to the war effort, both the both the smelters in, in Butte and Anaconda and the mines in Butte and the refineries pouring out miles and miles of copper wire in Great Falls uh, were extremely important to the war effort. And when the Congress took its first break in the session in August of 1917, uh, Jeanette made her first trip back to Montana and uh, she had tried during the campaign to, to have a big public event in Butte and, and wasn't successful, but uh, this time she was. And on the uh, uh, Saturday afternoon, August 18th, uh, right after big events like uh, Frank Little's hanging <coughs> and the, the horrible murder of uh, that IWW troublemaker and organizer, uh, Jeanette Rankin was there at Columbia Garden uh, giving a, a speech to the, uh, to the miners and their families. Uh, the speech, to my knowledge, has never surfaced before. It was, uh, I've been told that she didn't write much uh, on her own. Her speeches were either written for her, but she would make changes and uh, just before my book had to go to the publisher, manuscript had to go to the publisher, uh, Stuart McKenzie from Chinook, who deals in lots of very interesting Montana uh, memorabilia and paper material, uh, told me that he had 
the speech that she gave at Columbia Garden, and in, in fact it was, and it had some of her handwritten changes on it. He will eventually give that to the Silver Bowl uh, Butte archives, but in the meantime, he let me use a portion of it in the book, and she, she gives a, a very eloquent speech. Uh, she had had trouble with the company because she had been lobbying with them to drop the rustling card system, and we don't have time to get into the complexities of, of that tracking device the company was using for individual miners, but, but she condemned that and she tried to bring uh, uh, the miners, some of whom were striking, back to work. It, it was just a mess in the summer of 1917 uh, in, in Butte and Representative Rankin was trying to do what she could. And so she, uh, I'll just read a short portion of, 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 of that speech she gave, but she said, I'm glad to be in Montana. I was thrilled at the reception and she had had a huge reception at the train station when she arrived. She was charmed with the gallant policeman who protected the congressman from the enthusiasm of the constituents. During the suffrage campaign, one of my fondest hopes was to have a huge mass meeting at Columbia Gardens. While my dream did not come true at the time, this meeting far surpasses all my hopes to the size. And there were varying accounts, but let's say maybe a solid number was 6,000 were there at Columbia Gardens listening to her. I've been in constant attendance in Congress, although there have been many days when there was scarcely a quorum present. I have hesitated to leave Congress for a moment, for when I leave Congress, all women members leave Congress. <laughs> this great war might have ended without our being conscious of the part copper played in it had we not been suddenly confronted with a shortage in production of, of, uh, of copper. And, and I've just got a few excerpts from her speech, but carried along on the waves of misguided patriotism have some subtle attempts to destroy the industrial standards of this country, standards which have been wrought with so much toil and strife and suffering during the last half century. But it's also a misguided patriotism that believes that direct action has a place in civilized society. I have not, I have not patience with that spirit which seeks to destroy property to satisfy personal grievances or in the thought that direct action can right existing wrongs. The man who destroys a grain field is taking bread from a hungry child. The burden of waste always rests heaviest on the weak, on those least able to stand the strain. I have no patience with the alleged utterances of Frank Little, but I have the greatest contempt for that form of direct action that permitted the foul and cowardly murder of Frank Little, and so on. She goes on and, and then pleads with the copper miners to, you know, th th they were so important to the war effort and to persevere and to, to settle their differences and, and make sure they get back to work. Charlie, uh, in the meantime, was uh, doing some things uh, I had never heard about and thought were fun. Uh, he, of course, was a big uh, smoker. I didn't realize he had settled on Bull Durham when he first got to Montana Territory as a, as a teenager, but that's what he rolled and smoked. And, and so uh, in the uh, beginning of 1918, his tobacconist got hold of him and said, they put a hold on all Bull Durham for the duration of this calendar year and you'd better lay in a big supply because they're all going over to, to France and overseas to the troops. And Charlie, in essence, said, bullshit, I'm not getting more than my two-week supply. And that's exactly what he did all the while. He, he in his style, modeled this uh, pack train with a, with a pack mule loaded with Bull Durham, uh, making off and, and cheating the soldiers out of what they needed. So it was uh, one of those fun things to find along the way. <clears throat> and Charlie, of course, uh, did other things. Um, he's pretty well known as, as the originator of two paintings, uh, 
that uh, were used by the Food Administration. And, you know, it, that sounds like such an innocuous name, Food Administration. Well, that was Hoover, and Hooverizing was a big deal in World War I. Victory gardens or any other way to produce food. And, oh, by the way, this was at the very time when Montana, in 1917, unfortunately, suffered through the first year of a multi-year drought, and it lowered our grain production significantly, probably cut it in about half in both 1917 and 18. It was still significant, but it was a, a, a loss. And, and food was hugely important because we couldn't promise the British and French immediate 100 divisions fighting on the front in France and Belgium, but we could provide food, and we did in large quantities, and they were in need of it. And we also provided massive amounts of credit we didn't give them munitions and the other things, but we extended great quantities of credit. And uh, so Charlie was uh, busily putting uh, a couple of paintings together. Uh, one of them was, uh, I don't know if I have them both. Uh, one of them was this, uh, <laughs> I love this painting where the, where the horse is uh, after the oats that the, uh, the cowboys got and uh, and Charlie's poem, of course, he had to have a poem with his painting, and it, and it was called Hooverizum. I hate to take your grub, old horse, but then I'm leaving meat and wheat to fighting men, and by you hand, handing in your oats to me, the both of us is Hooverizum, see? We're scaring up with, um, squaring up with Uncle Sam, old friend, just kinder help and hold the easy end. And the other, uh, the other painting was this wonderful Meat Makes Fighters. Uh, and he sent those off to the uh, Food Administration in Bozeman, and they were both used in post posters. The poem that went with this one was, uh, it uh, was, I ain't a wearin' khaki cause I'm too old a stag, but I'm a handlin' bee and hide to them that holds the flag. Pie and cake is good when folks just feed for fun but beef and leather plenty puts men behind the gun. And all the while, here was Jeanette going to places like Tennessee, giving a speech before a packed uh, audience, and she really was a rock star uh, moving around the country representing something that she was working in Congress to achieve, and that was women's suffrage nationally. Montana and Several other Western states had achieved it, but the nation had not. And, and unfortunately, they would not during her term in Congress, but, but they moved it forward with her help, and uh, even to the point where uh, there was a showdown in 1918 where I think it was 25 Democratic congressmen uh, went to the White House and, and essentially demanded that President Wilson take a position on women's suffrage be, because to that point he had not come out in, in support of it. Well, at that point he finally did and so eventually the first the House while Jeanette was there and eventually the Senate passed, the, uh, passed that. And let me wrap up with a <coughs> a bit of a preview of my second book, which will come out in September next year. I had the choice with this book of either covering the whole war in a single volume, and yet I needed something like five or 600 pages to do it because I did not want to eliminate the first year of the war. That's when the stage was set for our success the second year. That's when Red Cross auxiliaries in Browning, in Haywarden, all across Montana in big and small communities were doing the knitting. They, I mean, the Red Cross was turning from an organization of something like 11,000 to 11 million in less than a year's time or in about a year and a half's time. It was absolutely amazing. And <clears throat> this talk isn't designed to go into great detail about it, but all kinds of things were opening up for women on the fighting front as well as at home. Red Cross work was important. 
the sweaters that were knitted. I've read letter after letter from the guys in France saying that I only made it through that cold, damp French climate because of my Red Cross sweater. And the, the uh, socks and sweaters and things like that were, were greatly valued. But women were, for the first time, welcomed into the U.S. Navy not only as nurses, and they'd been in the Army and Navy in some numbers in the Civil War and even in the interwar period, but big-time nurse numbers were needed in World War I, and something in the neighborhood of 24,000 nurses, either Red Cross or Red Cross and Army uh, nurses, uh, served. And I've found <clears throat> somewhere between uh, 200 and 250, I'm still sorting out exact numbers and exact identities between the, the ones, the, the women that served as nurses in the Army or those that served in the Red Cross. And so many Montana women's were, women were needed in that uh, nursing specialty. Also, the Navy was taking in uh, 16 or so Montana nurses, including one that uh, fortunately left fascinating uh, words about her service with the biggest Navy hospital in Europe, which was at Leith, Scotland. And she not, she'll be in both of my books because she not only talked about the uh, hospital and their service there, but at the end of the war, she was invited to go aboard an American battleship. And as the German fleet sailed into Scapa Flow to end their fleet, she was on that American battleship observing a huge, huge event like that. But women were also invited into the Navy, as I, as I started to say, for the first time as administrative types. Now, we Navy guys say yeoman, and of course, because they were female, they had to be yeoman F for female. But we had to have a nickname, too, so they were yeomanettes. I've even found <laughs> that the uh, Marine Corps, toward the end of the war, began to recruit Marine Fs, which unfortunately began to get called Marinettes. And uh, I, I know of two that were recruited for the Missoula recruiting office that the Marine Corps had, but I've yet to find their names and I've yet to find any other Montana women that went into the Marine Corps, but that had begun. So these new specialties, and oh, by the way, we didn't have a government and an army and a navy that were equipped like today's. We had s at least six organizations that ranged, ranged from the YMCA, the YWCA, Salvation Army, the, the uh, Red Cross, the Jewish Welfare Board, and so on, and, and a Catholic equivalent that all set up different service organizations and operations in France, and many Montana women served with that. I really believe overall there were probably at least 350 Montana women that served overseas, and uh, some of them you've never heard about, and yet they were doing it. Eddie Can there was no USO, the United Services Organization, to go over and entertain the troops. So Eddie Cantor and a group of entertainers organized the Over the Theater, Over Their Theater group, and they recruited two Butte women who were very talented singers and entertainers, and so two Montanans were even in Eddie Cantor's Over Their Theater group. So finding all this has really been a challenge. Also, uh, just, just parenthetically, finding the names and numbers of the Native American warriors that went over. Uh, two Native nurses did. Uh, they both served in the Army, uh, but uh, the Historical Society here has a, a really beginning of a good database that has a lot of service, Native servicemen in it, but they only identify about 66 in World War I, and th at this point I've identified at least 150. The major reason is that all of those sons and grandsons of fur traders and early settlers who were part Blackfoot or part Assiniboine, you know, so many, uh, they all went in as white, 
in their uh, racial identif identification cards. So tracking down that has been a challenge. I, last year I did the same thing with African Americans. That was a little easier. It was a lot easier because they all had the racial uh, identification on their army cards, but the Navy didn't record race because it had been interracial since the War of 1812. So anyway, getting, getting back to just a, a bit of a preview, this is a wonderful Charlie Russell illustrated letter, uh, one of two that I've found that uh, had uh, World War I battle scenes, and here's the battle scene. This will be on the, uh, just as Smoking Them Out is on the back cover of my first book that covers the first year of the war. Uh, this uh, battle scene will be on the second book. And I guess with that, uh, as we approach the 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month armistice ending, um, I, I hope that uh, a lot of you will find a, a way to ring bells at the 11th hour to commemorate the end of that very short for America, very long for Europe, brutal war. But uh, with that, I'll close and be glad to answer some questions and then sign some books for Rod outside the uh, gift shop.